Hello out there YouTubers and welcome to P.E. Slick Podcast. I'm your host Matt here. Each week I'm going to bring you something different in terms of leadership, ministering, entertainment, book authoring, and much more. But before we begin each time, I'm going to be airing a classic throwback commercial from back in the 80s or 90s or 2000s for my personal liking. Stay tuned. I can't believe it. Don't you ever quit? I've been away a long time, and my roommate's still going strong. Renews it roommate air freshener with twice the freshening liquid, so it freshens air longer than magic mushroom. Long-lasting roommate. And we're back with P.E. Slick Podcast. Joining me this week is my former teacher, Mr. Kenny Lloyd. Kenny Lloyd was a teacher at Woodlawn High School and was my one of my first teachers during my freshman year. And I got I got to tell you, Mr. Lloyd, I, I really appreciate what you've done for me, teaching me the right way, because my freshman year was not the best years. And I got to say, you was one of my the first few teachers I could say who I considered a friend and a good mentor. So I thank you for that. Well, thank you, sir. And excuse me, I'm, you, you sung such great phrases, and I'm sitting here with food in my mouth, so... <laughs> That's okay. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, where are you from? I'm originally from um, Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a project kid out of uh, Brownsville. Okay. Um, probably can't tell by the voice, but um, um, yep, originally from there and then moved to Virginia uh, right before high school uh, when my parents passed away. Oh, uh, hmm. okay. Now, seeing as how you went into teaching, um, I'm just curious as to, you know, what was your favorite subject when you was in school? <laughs> Anything but social studies, I'll tell you that. That's what I end up doing now. Um, <laughs> that, was your, that was your typical kid. Um, loved PE class, um, loved shop class. Uh, you know, they don't offer, you know, shop classes anymore, really. Right. Um, loved mechanical drawing. We had that was an option. Um, you know, I love building things. Um, I love running around. So sports was always my thing and, and building stuff. And then all the other classes I, I consider were just to be fillerings, you know? Right. Okay. Uh, now, how did you get into teaching? Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> wow. Well, never saw it coming. Um, I was working um, with a company contracted out of DJJ. Okay. Um, decided to go to uh, uh, to get my master's degree. Was dating a girl at the time who convinced me. You know, women have a tendency to convince you to do some things you probably would never do. Um, <laughs> she convinced me to to apply to grad school, at University of Baltimore. Okay. Um, I figured since I was already in the field of criminal justice, I would work on getting a master's there. Um, had thoughts of becoming like an FBI agent. Um, wow. <laughs> and then um, I started thinking that, you know, if they put me undercover, that lifestyle would be too attractive. You know, I watch a lot of movies, so you know how when those guys go undercover, it's tough for them to come back out. Um, I, I saw myself as being that kind of person. And then I thought, well, I surely would hate to die in a shootout. Um, so I was getting kind of second thoughts about it. Um, meanwhile, while in grad school, I needed a job, um, and so I started um, substitute teaching. Okay. And that's how it started. And that's how we all knew and loved Mr. Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> um, what advice did anybody give you um, as far as starting to become a teacher? Um, well, you know, the number one thing is, I don't know if anybody really gave me the advice. Um, you know, first of all, when you're a black man and you have some type of physical size to you, they, they seem to throw you in special ed. Um, you know, so uh, the thing I think I already came to the table with is that I like kids. Um, and because I like kids and was able to relate to kids, um, that made my job a whole lot easier. And then having a regular job before, you know, where you only get two weeks vacation time, where in the school system you get eight weeks plus, you know, 
So I, I, I appreciated all the other uh, things that came with education. But um, as, as far as somebody giving me advice, um, I, I really didn't feel that. I really felt like it was a profession that they, they throw you in, um, maybe give you some support your first year, and then you're on your own after that. Wow. <laughs> Uh, one terminology that I remember you taught my group of people from my high school times was the phrase, no child left behind. Where do you figure that term fits with uh, education, especially today's generation? Well, you know, I stole that term from an initiative by, by former President Bush. Um, I think the state of education right now is, is in, uh, is in uh, what's, what's a good word? It's about to just blow up. Um, I, I don't think we are. I think we forget a, a lot of a lot of the basic things that are important. So let me give you an example. Okay. We're, we're trying to math and science people, and we tell them all the time, go to college, right? Yes. Okay. Well, have you ever gotten your hair cut? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's a simple question, right? Right. You got you got your hair cut, right? Mm-hmm. Two weeks. Two weeks later, don't you have to go back and get another one? Yeah. Okay. We don't tell kids that, right? We make it seem like your road to riches has to come through getting in debt by going to college. But what we don't tell them is you can make just as much money, if not more money, learning a, a reputable trade, a trade that will pay you money. Something so, so easy and simple as cutting hair. Something so easy and simple as putting in a weave. Something so <laughs> easy. And, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm not saying that the job is easy, but the, the the monetary reward for the for the amount of work that you're doing, it becomes easy. You understand what I'm saying? When right. Your, when your air conditioning goes out, you don't call UMBC. You don't call University of Maryland, right? Right. You call somebody who was a licensed professional. They didn't get those licenses at these four-year schools. They got these licenses at Lincoln Tech. Um, it used to be when I was coming up, you could get those licenses while still in high school. Hmm. So it's almost like we, 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 we took all that away. You know, like I'll take Baltimore County, for instance. You have a vocational center on the other side of the town. What's right. The majority, what's the majority color of the other people on the other side of town? White, right? So, yes. but, but, but yet the county screens equal education for everybody. Uh, uh, can you curse on this podcast? I don't want to accidentally curse, so I won't curse. It's, okay. bull, <laughs> it's bull malarkey, you know? It's right. enforcement of it. And, and, and they feed it to you every single time because all they really care about now is their bottom number. Oh, we graduated 80-something percent. Oh, okay, you may have 80-something percent may have walked across the stage. But not 80 percent of those kids every single year are prepared for what's ahead of them out in the real world. So it's it's in a state of emergency. OK. Yeah, I, I understand that. And I'm, I'm sure a lot with uh, politics and other things that's going on um, isn't helping much either. Uh, that's actually kind of one of the questions I was going to ask you about. Uh, do you believe leadership and communication falls into teaching what do you mean by that so like for leadership for instance somebody to take leadership to who who says leadership is important in terms of changing the culture in the world and communication pretty much is like like with teaching you're you're communicating with people um especially the kids and they need a good education so that's kind of what i mean by as far as leadership and communication a leader meaning somebody who is willing to take the time to teach children and communication teaching them so it's sort of like this in my opinion i don't think you'll ever find true leaders in the field of education okay because and here's the reason why those two leaders get a paycheck right mm -hmm. so if, if you don't own the company you work for the company okay so because you work for the company you're going to do what the company tells you to do right right so you may have the title of a leader, but are you truly a leader? Because if you do something that goes against what the company, uh, the direction that the company wants to go in, well, then you will lose that six-figure job. 
Right. So now, what position are they in? Are they really in any position to make change? No. They just they're just another piece on the chessboard. They might be a little bit more powerful than a pawn, but they're still a piece nonetheless. Wow, you gave me you gave me a lot to think about there. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's, it's, you, you look at these superintendents. Super last was one superintendent Dallas Dance, right? Two hundred and something thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Thirty years old. Thirty years old. If if you equate that to teacher years, most teachers start around twenty three, twenty four, right? Right. You you you're just getting your feet wet at six years into this profession. He is. He was the superintendent of schools. What could he possibly? What connection could he possibly have to the classroom? See, it's, it's like sports. That's why owners don't coach. Right. But the really good franchise empower the coaches to make those decisions. That's in the best interest of the team. Right. Education doesn't do that. Education won't listen to what teachers have to say because the people who evaluate teachers are never in the classroom. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> so for you to tell a teacher whether or not they're a good enough teacher, you come into the classroom, some districts say you got to be in there for an entire class period. Some districts say you ain't got to be there but a half an hour. How are you going to sit there and tell whether or not a teacher is a good teacher and you've only been in there? I'll, I'll give you one class out of 180. If the teacher fails too many kids, then there's something wrong with the teacher. Let me say that again. If the teacher has standards and the teacher fails too many kids, it's the teacher that ends up in a meeting and could lose their job. Right. Crazy, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I guess that kind of ties into my next question there. Um, I was going to ask you, so – what are some highs and lows that comes with teaching? Like, what's some good and what are some bad that comes with teaching? Well, let me talk about the good first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you. When somebody tells me or complains about teaching as a teacher, um, I, I have to I, – I just grin at them. Look, Matt, let's just be honest. I get every Jewish holiday off that the district gets off, and I'm not Jewish. I get every Christian holiday off, but I'm not a devout Christian. You feel what I'm saying? Yes. If it snows too much, I don't go to work, but I get paid for it. You feel me? Yeah. According to the governor, I got to be out by June 15th. And I can't come back until after Labor Day. This past summer, that was like almost nine to ten weeks off with pay. Right. It, it it's laughable. It it really is. It, it's laughable. I mean, we're still in the old plantation system of school being out in the summer. And so it's, from that piece, it's a wonderful profession. If you love kids, oh, let me back up. My day starts at 7.15 and I'm done by 2.30. Hmm. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. you truly, well, so I teach four classes. Well, we're in a four. We're in a block system. A day, B day, four classes. I only okay. teach three. Of, I only teach three of the four periods. So, in essence, I guess I'm, I'm breaking teacher code here. But in essence, I teach four and a half. I have an audience in front of me four and a half hours a day. How can I complain, Matt? How can I complain? Right. Now, what what's crappy about teaching? Well, when you first get into it. You got people who are not even in the classroom trying to tell you whether or not you're going to be a good teacher. You've got, I've always said the adults that are in teaching are no different than the children. They just as catty. They just as, as nasty. They're just as mean. They're just probably more. They just as vindictive. They are, they can be selfish. Um, and don't let one, who who brings already those nasty attitudes to the table become a supervisor. Now you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, you know, so you, you take, you know, you take the adults out of the equation, which is the, I think is the bad part about teaching is some it's the teachers that you work with, and or the or your administration, um, 
early in your career. I mean, you're young anyhow, 24, 25, you're making about $50,000 a year. Right. You can't really complain about that. You know, like, so I don't, I don't know, aside from the, the BS that the other adults put you through, I don't see the, the terrible thing about education. I mean, sometimes the kids can get on your nerves, but you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a different yeah. time. Yeah, I, I understand that. <laughs> um, now, how how has the technology changed from school wise, education wise, from your time in school when you were teaching my generation to the generation now, twenty twenty? I mean, I know cell phones is a big thing, of course. <laughs> kids, kids, kids are dumber. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep it. 100 with you is that what they say let me keep it 100 with you overall kids are dumber now now let me let me explain why. and here's the dip when i was in school you had to read to find to do research you had to know your alphabet to go through the car catalog you had to understand the the dewey decimal system you had to understand that in order to do research you had to read books your generation came up and we they, they tried to say, well, you know what, Matt? You don't need to know what one plus one is. You don't need to know what four times four is, four times seven, six times eight, seven times nine. You don't need to know that, Matt. You just pull out a calculator and punch in the calculator and let the calculator tell you. Right? Right. So what, what does that do? That dummies you down. Right. Right? So... We we really were was mastering the dummy down system when you were coming through, right? Let's not teach you the the things that you necess- that's that's absolutely necessary for you to be able to just take care of yourself. So when I was in school, we had we we had to learn how to fill out an application. We had to know our social security number. There was no pulling out a card or I don't know it or this that and the third. You had to know it, right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, it, the, the base, we had to learn how to budget a checkbook. It wasn't just in a class that you took as part of a lesson. Oh, wow. For the next two weeks, we're going to we're going to play um, budget. Now, this was serious. And then the most important thing, and, and I think it's, it's, it's just a shame of where we mastered it with 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 your generation. And I'm going to get to the, the future kids is that we told you that you did not need to learn how to write cursive. See, when we told you that you couldn't write cursive, that means you, there's no way that you can take notes quickly. When you can't take notes quickly, that means information is passing you by. More hmm. importantly, in order to attain maximum wealth in America, what do you have to do? Sign some checks, right? Right. How are you going to sign some checks you don't know how to write cursive? Right. That is important. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Right. We, took, we, we began to take out the, the, the reading and the writing. So now what we said is we're not going to teach you how to write uh, like, uh, I'm going to say upper management, right? But I think we know who we're talking about. Yes. We're, we're not going to teach you how to write like upper management. Mm-hmm. We're not going to teach you how to read like upper management. We're not even going to teach you how to speak like upper management. You want to know why? Because we don't want you in upper management. We want you to compete for the job that nobody else really wants. Right. And once you get a lot of people competing for the jobs that nobody really wants, and then if we move forward and you have this huge Spanish influx coming into America, who's willing to do the jobs that nobody wanted to do, you know, when you were here, when you were growing up, Mm -hmm. where does that leave the, 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 the non upper class, that, that non boardroom people, it leaves them, leaves them to be, to compete for jobs that don't exist. Right. Now we got a problem. Because we got to eat, right? Right. We got, it's, it's man, you go into man survival mode. And then that's why we got all these, issues, in my opinion, that sparked a lot of these issues we have today. All right. So you move it to the, to the kid today, 
I got kids. I, you know, it's wild. I, I teach AP now, right? This mm-hmm. is after this is after they told me I couldn't even teach at all, right? It was amazing. So now I teach AP government. And I still see with my AP kids, they a period, the next word, the next letter is not capitalized. Sometimes they struggle with proper nouns versus uh, uh, common nouns. Um, they throw commas in the craziest places. They don't know how to speak in front of people. They, it, it, they don't like to read. You know, now with the cell phone and the way technology is, they, they try to write their papers on their cell phone. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> they, oh, wow. They don't want to search for answers. They don't want to do any research to get the answers because all you have to do is say, hey, Siri, what is such and such? You know, so it's, it's again, it's, it's a system in which we're, 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 dumbing, we're dumbing down. The masses of those that are being dummied down is increasing at an unbelievable rate. And so where, where are those people going to work? Right. What are they going to do? What are they going to do to survive? I didn't know the technology had changed that much since I was out. I mean, I know next year it'll be 10 years since I graduated from Woodlawn High. I, I knew the technology with phones had changed, but I didn't know it changed that oh much. <laughs> did, did we have iPhones when you were in school? No. No. We're on, we're on 11 now, right? Yeah. There you go. Right, because I remember from my time when cell phones were out, it was, you know, the common flip phones, you know, mm-hmm. the, the flip ones. And, you know, they wasn't as advanced as they are now with tablets and all that stuff now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's moving. We're, we're, with, with technology, there's, with anything, though, there's good and there's bad. Right. And so... Where we are moving forward, techno, you know, technologically wise, can be good. Everything comes with consequences. I mean, imagine how competitive it must be for those, um, what was those ladies in Hollywood who paid that astronomical amount of money for their kids to go to a college? Did you hear about that? They paid off the college. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I knew them two actresses too. Yeah, I, I heard about that. Yeah. But think about that for a second. Just for a second. Is it is it that competitive? Right. That you're willing to pay millions of dollars to get your child to go to a certain school? Wow. <laughs> and those are the ones that can afford those type of bribes. Right. Well, Mr. Lloyd, you touched on some very competitive topics here and i appreciate everything you've you've talked about and especially with education wise because education is important and one thing i wanted to ask though is what advice this is kind of a big one here but you know short or long what advice can you give the next generation of high schoolers i mean i know when I was in school. You were teaching high school. Are you, are you still teaching high school today? Mm-hmm. Still in high school. Okay. So what advice can you give the next generation of high schoolers coming up? Because um, now, you know, we're going into 2020. When 2010 came, when I graduated, that was a whole new decade. And now next year is 2020. And who knows what's to come between 2020 and 2030. So what advice can you give the next generation of high schoolers? What I would tell them is, um, be be aware and be involved. Um, what do I mean by that? Be aware of what's going on around you. And be involved in that awareness. Look, life is, life is not difficult because it's the same thing over and over every single day. Right? Right. I don't even think about it. Sun goes down, going down now, right? Right. I know it's going to come back up. And you get to start it all over again. Think of, think about that concept for a second as a kid. If you do nothing today, you can expect to have nothing tomorrow. But if you do something today, 
that gives you a jump start on tomorrow. Absolutely. And sometimes it can be just that simple. Right. Absolutely. So what are Kenny Lloyd's plans for the new year, 2020? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I'm sure to keep teaching, of course, but, you know. My my plans for 2020. Let, let, let me, um, you know, Matt, I don't, I don't have, like, long-term, I don't, you know, and maybe that's bad, maybe it's hypocritical of me. I, I don't have long-term plans, you know. I, I've been very, very fortunate, very lucky to be in some situations um, that I just sat back and be like, wow, like, I'm sitting here right now. You know, I've been on a Final Four floor before. I, I run down the streets of Bourbon Street. I, you know, I, I've, I, I've, I've had some, uh, I've had a great life. 2020 to me is no different than 2010, no different than 2007, no different than, you know, it's, I don't live by the year, Matt. I, I just hope that I got everything in order for November. So when the bill guy comes in November, I can pay November. Okay. After November, <laughs> let's get it all together again in November, right? Right. Because I got to get ready because he's going to be asking for it again in December. Absolutely. And that's, a, that's how I've just learned to live. Um, because if I don't, and I'm not saying I don't look, you know, oh, I'm going to look forward. Here, I'm going to keep it simple. I want to play a lot of golf in 2020. So, I got to set myself up now so I can play a lot of golf in 2020. There you go. Yeah, I remember <laughs> you, you talked about a lot of golf back when I was in school. I'm, I'm glad you still uh, – I see you still keeping up with with golf. Um, you still follow football too, right? You still a Ravens fan? Oh, oh yeah. There yeah. you go. There's always that, that love-hate relationship. Um, <laughs> You know, that comes with uh, professional sports. But I, I'll tell you real quick. I was talking to my kids today, and we were talking about, um, so one of the girls came in, in class, and she had on a, I guess it's a Yeezus or something like that, sweatshirt and some sneakers. I guess that um, Kanye West. Right. Um, is, okay. So I asked her how much were the shoes. She said the shoes were like $300 in the sweatshirt and all that. So we started having conversations. And I said to her, uh, not you know, not to drag this on, about um, you remember I told you about be aware and then get involved, right? Uh, and so she was talking about how she didn't necessarily agree with Kanye West's um, actions and comments. However, she likes his gear. So we I, we started talking, and you know, you mentioned football, and I said, you know, we all know that Colin Kaepernick, in one way, sense, form, or another, was blackballed out of the NFL. Right. I said, how powerful of a message would it have sent if black athletes decided not to participate until he received a job? How long do you think the NFL would have went on before Colin Kaepernick got employed? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good one to think about that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so anyhow, I kind of sort of forgot how we got. Oh, you asked me about football. So, yeah, yeah. so um, I, um, yeah, I'm a Ravens fan. Um, five and two, we're ahead of the schedule. And you know what's amazing, though? It's even, I mean, just, just look at how how people criticize this young man. You know, um, look, Lamar Jackson, not the best public speaker in the world. No, no, you know what? He is a good public speaker. He speaks where he comes from. You know, I don't, maybe we people expect him to speak like he's upper management, right? But he's not. You know, he is him, and I'm. I respect that for him. I, I mean, I, I really do. I may have been critical at first, like, oh, he needs a PR person. He needs to clean his image up. You know what? No, he doesn't. Be you. And if you notice, they are trying every way to say that. Oh, he's he's not uh, the average quarterback. Okay. Let's let's take a look at something. Last I checked, it doesn't matter how the ball gets there, right? Mm -hmm. The ball just needs to get there, correct? Right. 
And last I checked, quarterbacks are judged on their wins and losses, right? Right. Okay. Because uh, the guy up in New England, who I had nothing but the utmost respect for, mm-hmm. he's got six rings, right? Right. How many of those rings were won because a field goal kicker kicked it through the upright? Mm. But they don't take they don't take his power away. They yeah. don't say, "Oh well, but right." So, um, I wish this guy nothing but the best of luck. I hope he stays healthy. Um, I I tell you what, he's fun to watch. Right. Who is, who is he fun to watch? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so uh, and and then this time Baltimore needs a little fun to watch because it's going through some rough stuff, man. Yeah, they have definitely. Uh, well, before we wrap, I had two qu- quick questions I wanted to ask you from our conversation. Uh, the first one, when you first got into teaching, um, you had mentioned in your conversations about, you know, turning around and you got an audience there. Were you a little, were you nervous when you first started teaching at first? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was wild. My, my first real teaching job was at Patapsco High School. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, it was a, uh, self-contained um, special ed class. Um, and I remember standing there and, you know, that area wasn't exactly African-American friendly. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I just, it was, it, I, it was a really fun and exciting time. It was an eye opener too, um, because I had to deal with a lot of backdoor racism. Mm. Uh, and not me per se as a teacher because you know i can always hop in my car at the end of the day and go home you know but we had we didn't have a large black population um and helping them deal with it you know that was um that was a challenge that at first i i, I didn't see it coming you know right um, but then it, it really reared its head in football where when all the black kids are standing on the sideline and I'm looking around me. I'm like, <laughs> uh, okay. And all the white kids are on the football field. Um, and so I integrated the black kids on the defensive end, defensive side of the ball. Um, and we ended up having one hell of a defense. And I'm not saying we had one hell of a defense because all oh, well, the black kids played, so therefore the whites couldn't play. But I think what I instituted there was that black or white, the best person to play. Right. Uh, so, and then it was the same thing in my classroom, like black and white exist. And I think what I tried to do was, yeah, it does exist. I didn't act like it didn't exist, you know? Um, and so I would use, uh, for examples, black people and white people and Spanish people. And, and I think over a small period of time, it made people understand that I could give two rats tail about what color you are. We're, we're all in the same room at this moment in the same place. So if we're all in the same place, who could actually be better than the other? Right. And my last question to you is, um, of course, I want to give a shout out to your daughter. Um, She's grown a lot since from my time in in school. (laughs) Um, I remember you had pictures of of her from in the classrooms and you you posted photos of her over the years and you recently put one of her for homecoming. I'm like, man, she is, you know, growing up since my years. I'm, we, we, we getting old here. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just getting older. But yeah, <laughs> at, at Woodlawn, she was, um, three, four. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that would be about right. Um, maybe, yep. Three, four. Um, I used to, tra- <laughs> I used to dress her up in boy sweatsuits. <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, because she didn't know any different, but right. um, yeah, it's it's been a um, it's been an unbelievable transformation. Um, it, it actually uh, she has taught me more um, than she will ever know. Um, she has made me strong. She has made me brave. Um, she has made me understand uh, my work. Um, right. And 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 I'll tell you right now, if you're ever blessed to to have a child, one do it the right way because boy court court and everything is about my it was rough you know (laughs) i ain't gonna lie it was rough right um but you know stay the course and if your heart is truly where it's supposed to be you know things have a tendency to work out um 
but you'll find your inner strength there when you realize that it's not just about me, um, that somebody else is relying on me. And then that unselfishness, because you have to sacrifice a lot of your happy so so your child can be happy. And right. some people have a tough time with that, you know? Absolutely. Um, and understandably so. But if you're able to do it, uh, the gratification is a hundred times better than if you were to do something for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm also certain too, that she's going to uh, follow in your footsteps and be a teacher too, right? <laughs> oh, I would tell her absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, fine. Uh, you know, whatever she decides to do, uh, you know, I, I just, I hope what she learns is number one, If you find something you love to do, you never work a day in your life. I'm a strong believer in that. Number two, have a side, have a legal side hustle. Something that that you don't work hard for that puts a little money in your pocket so you have some spending change. Um, And and then number three, don't don't ever quit a job until you have another job already lined up. that last one was a lesson I learned the hard way in my 20s. Because, um, you know, sometimes you try to be prideful. You know, what? You ain't going to say that to me. Throw your keys down on the table. I'm gone. Ha! You know, and little did I realize that the next day they were probably like, hey, this is John. He's taking Kenny's spot. Meanwhile, Kenny is outside unemployed. You know. Right. Keeping it real ain't always keeping it real. Right. Um, but whatever she decides to do, you know, I just tell her, you know, education is important. Um, try to get as much of it as you can before 25. Um, and then live life. Go, go see where it takes you. Right. Absolutely. And I, I really love that quote you made about education. Um, we haven't talked in a while, but uh, my grandfather passed in 2015. And um, he, he was really big on education. And that was something that was important to him. And um, I, I really believe education is important. And what she was talking about before, as far as people, the right people finding the time to be leaders and teach, that is important, especially with the next generation coming up and everything. Ms. Lloyd, I want to thank you for taking the time out to join my podcast. Um, I know it was kind of left field when I threw that out there, you know, Matt Parrish <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> I've gotten into photography and filmmaking, and this is one of the things on my list as well as uh, finding a way to promote my mystery book. So um, some things have, some things have changed here and there since we last saw, but I'm like I said, I'm I'm thankful that you're one of the few that I remain in contact with, and I hope you continue to listen to my podcast. I plan to have leadership uh, actors, actresses. I went to school with a singer. And my pastor I'm going to have one in a few weeks for an interview, so I hope you listen for that one. Absolutely. So I I thank you for the time for the interview and for my guys that's following me. Remember, education is important, and it's the key to life, and in Jesus' name. So you guys have a good night, and thank you, Mr. Lloyd, for coming up. Thank you. You know the clean, natural freshness of clothes dried outdoors? Now you can capture it indoors. Introducing Downy Clean Breeze, freshness that's released by dropping the downy ball in as you start the wash. Also in Tide Clean Breeze. The unmistakable line dried freshness of new Downy Clean Breeze. It touches so much more than clothes.